assalamu alaikum i hope everybody is doing well and had a good and a refreshed break i am back again with another video where we are going to look at the last sub topic of unit 1 that is pathogens in today's class we shall learn what is the difference between a parasite and a pathogen then we shall also see some of the diseases caused by these organisms and we are going to revise antibiotics and vaccination which we had already studied in our last years biology class so let's begin with studying the difference between parasite and a pathogen both are similar but there are a few differences between them let us see what they are a parasite is an organism that lives inside or on another organism which is called as the host organism so any organism that is living inside or on the host cell and benefits from the host is called as a parasite and any organism who causes disease is called a pathogen so pathogens are disease causing agents and they cause sickness to the host coming to the next point parasites are macroscopic organisms macroscopic means they are visible to the naked eyes whereas pathogens can either be microscopic or macroscopic that means some pathogens are visible only under the microscope and some pathogens you can observe it through your naked eyes so they are either microscopic or macroscopic organisms moving on all the parasites do not cause infectious diseases in the host organism they might be living inside the host cell or on the host organism but all the parasites do not cause infectious diseases to the host whereas all the pathogens are responsible for causing diseases in the host organism so all the pathogens are going to cause diseases so not all the parasites are pathogens pathogen can be anything which is causing disease so not all the parasites are pathogens then we have three main types of parasites the first one is protozoa the next one is helminth and the other one is ectoparasites i am sure you are familiar with the term protozoa what do you mean by helminth helminth are nothing but worms you know worms like round worm tape worm so these are large macro parasites they are basically like worms and ectoparasites they are the parasites that live on the outside of the host cell okay so ectoparasites are the parasites which live outside of the host cell examples of ectoparasites include lice or fleas whereas pathogens are of six types you've got viruses you've got bacteria fungi protozoa helminth and rickettsia what is this rickettsia again these are pathogens which grow inside the living cells and are similar to bacteria so they are pathogens they grow inside the living cells and are similar to bacteria so this was all about the difference between a pathogen and a
parasite. In addition to some viruses, some bacteria, fungi and protoctists cause diseases. Now, what are protoctists? Protoctists are sometimes called the dustbin kingdom. Why are they called the dustbin kingdom? Because they are a mixed group of organisms. You cannot place them into any class of organism. You cannot place them into plants or animals or fungi. That is why they are called as a dustbin kingdom. Most of the protoctists are microscopic. That is, you can only see them under the microscope. And they are single-celled organisms. That means they have got only one cell. Some of them look like animal cells such as amoeba. So amoeba is a protoctist. Some of the organisms which look like animal cells but are not actually animals. They are called as protoctist. Okay. And basically or they are called as protozoa. Now other protoctists have chloroplasts and they carry out photosynthesis and they are more like plants. They are not plants but they have got characteristics like plants. So they are called as algae. So basically you have got two protoctists that is protozoa and algae. Those which have got characteristics like animals are called as protozoa and those who have characteristics like plants are called as algae. Example of protozoa we saw is amoeba. Right? Then there are some protoctists which also cause diseases such as the plasmodium. Plasmodium is an organism which causes malaria. You can just look at it in detail in the next half of the video. So just for now remember plasmodium is a parasite which causes malaria. So before looking on to the diseases caused by these organisms, let us first quickly see the structure of these organisms. If you remember... In our previous class, we had studied the structure of a virus. Let us quickly revise it. As you all know, viruses are smaller than bacteria, right? They do not have any cell wall, they don't have any mitochondria, no nucleus and they cannot live independently. So what do they do? They have to depend on the host cell. So they reproduce inside the cells which are called as the host cell. And they have got the genetic material in the form of either DNA or RNA which is surrounded by a protein coat and then they take the envelope from the host cell. So basically viruses have no cell wall, no mitochondria, no nucleus and they cannot live independently and they are also smaller than bacteria. Now we look at the structure of a bacteria. So bacteria are single celled organisms right as you can see they have got a cell wall they have cell membrane they also have cytoplasm but they do not have a nucleus. So bacteria are single celled organisms they have cell wall cell membrane cytoplasm but they do not have nucleus. Some bacteria may also have flagellum which helps them to move. Bacteria also have got circular structures which is called as the plasmid. Now we are going to look at the structure of a fungi. As you can see on the screen this is structure of a yeast cell. Now fungi are of two types. Some funguses are unicellular and some fungi are multicellular an example of a single celled fungi is the yeast so we are looking at the structure of an yeast cell so it has got cell wall it has got cell membrane it has cytoplasm it has got nucleus and 
it also has got mitochondria so all the fungal cells have cell walls cell membrane cytoplasm and mitochondria and they vary in size from single cell to large multicellular an example of a single cell fungi is yeast an example of a multicellular organism is the mushroom now this is the structure of mycelium of mucor if you remember we have observed this under the microscope right the structure of fungus so it has got a spore case which has got spores in it then it has got different branches which are called as hyphae and all these branches together or all this or a network of hyphae together is called as the mycelium so it has got the spore case inside the spore case there are spores then it has got emerging branches out of it which are called as hyphae and a network of many hyphae together is called as mycelium hyphae are basically thread like filaments so a mushroom has got many fine thread like filaments which is called as hyphae right a mold is also like a mushroom and this is the structure of the mold now after knowing the structures of each organism in detail we are going to look at few diseases which are caused by these organisms yes we've studied all this last year as well so i hope you can recollect what is this picture telling you about which disease is this yes the most common one flu right and flu is a viral disease flu is caused by a virus and what are the symptoms of flu you've got headache fever runny nose you've got a sore throat your body pains very tired right so we studied a viral disease that was flu coming to another disease which is the dengue let us see what it is we'll just quickly revise it dengue fever is also known as breakbone fever it is a mosquito borne tropical disease dengue definitely is caused by a mosquito when a mosquito bites but that mosquito when it is biting you it is injecting the virus inside the body so again dengue is also a viral disease so it is caused by a dengue virus and it is caused by oh sorry it is transmitted by mosquito which is called as the aedes aegypti so the name of the mosquito is aedes aegypti this mosquito is going to inject the dengue virus in the person it is going to bite so the mode of transmission is that this virus is transmitted to humans through the bite of the infected female mosquito which mosquito aedes aegypti we all know the symptoms of dengue got rashes sudden onset of high fever stomach pain vomiting headache and so on right so you should be very careful around mosquitoes you should keep the surrounding clean so we studied two viral diseases one was flu and the next one was dengue yes i hope you remember this picture this disease is called as the athlete's foot the athlete's foot this is caused by a fungus so it is a very common fungal disease what happens in this disease the skin on the foot begins to peel and crack and the skin beneath your 
uh, or the skin between your toes the burn and itch and small blisters are seen on the skin so these are all the symptoms of athlete's foot this is a fungal disease we have another fungal disease which is called as the ring worm the name itself is telling you there is a ring like patch on the body which is caused by the fungus what are the symptoms yes it starts with a small red or scaly area on the skin then you've got minor burning or itching and it becomes a red brown or gray rash so this these two were the fungal diseases that was athlete's foot and ringworm and we also saw two viral diseases that was flu and dengue so then we have to come to bacterial diseases right the bacterial disease is typhoid typhoid is caused by a bacteria who is salmonella typhi so the name of the bacteria causing typhoid is salmonella typhi it is transmitted through contaminated food and water so what are the symptoms of typhoid high fever then diarrhea constipation loss of appetite means you don't feel like eating anything you feel sick you feel nauseatic you've got abdominal pain all these are the symptoms of typhoid another bacterial disease that we are going to see is cholera okay cholera is basically an infection of the intestinal tract it is caused by a bacterium which is called as vibrio cholerae this infection is also spread by contaminated water and food what are the symptoms symptoms are watery diarrhea then again you feel nauseatic you feel like vomiting there is dehydration blood pressure goes very low and so on so typhoid and cholera are the bacterial disease typhoid is caused by salmonella and cholera is caused by vibrio cholerae the next disease that we are going to study is malaria as we saw in the previous slide that malaria is caused by a protoctist what was the name of the protoctist which caused malaria it was caused by plasmodium right so malaria is a life threatening disease which is caused by a parasite and are transmitted through again by the bite of the mosquito and the name of the mosquito is anopheles mosquito in dengue we had female aedes aegypti mosquito which was transmitting the virus and in malaria the name of the mosquito is female anopheles mosquito this mosquito carries the parasite that is the plasmodium and when the mosquito bites it injects the parasite inside the body so the symptoms of malaria are you've got a severe headache fever back pain right so these are all the symptoms of malaria so far we saw the difference between pathogen and parasite and we saw the diseases which are caused by them we saw viral diseases like flu and dengue then bacterial diseases like salmonella type uh, typhi which causes typhoid and vibrio cholerae which causes cholera then fungal diseases like athlete's foot and uh, ringworm and also a disease caused by a protoctist which is called as malaria moving on we also need to study two two important topics in this video that is antibiotics and vaccination so first we are going to see what antibiotics are the word antibiotic 
it is a greek word in which anti means against and bios means life so an antibiotic is a drug which kills or slows the growth of bacteria okay antibiotic is a drug which is going to kill or reduce the growth of bacteria the first antibiotic was discovered by alexander fleming in the year 1928 i hope you remember all this as we have studied everything last year we just going to have a quick recapitulation of what we have studied now as you know the discovery of antibiotic was accidental alexander fleming was growing a back a fungus on a plate sorry alexander fleming was growing a bacteria on a plate but there was contamination on the plate and suddenly he saw a fungus growing on the plate and wherever there was that fungus no bacteria could grow over there so then it was found that he thought there is some chemical present in the fungus which is stopping this bacterial growth so he did all the research and then he found out the fungus penicillium was producing a chemical which further was named as penicillin so penicillin was the first antibiotic which was discovered by alexander fleming it was an accidental discovery fleming was growing certain bacteria on his plate but due to contamination he saw that there was an unusual fungus growing on his plate and around the fungus near the vicinity of the fungus there was no bacterial growth so he was curious he thought that there maybe there is something present in the fungus or something produced by the fungus which is stopping the bacteria from growing so then he found out that it is an antibiotic and he named it as penicillin after the name of the fungus penicillium let us see what are the different antibiotics a few examples a few examples of antibiotics are amoxicillin then you've got tetracycline erythromycin cephalosporin chloramphenicol doxycycline azithromycin there are a huge number of antibiotics you just need to remember at least 5 now look at this picture there are different antibiotics used now for example one particular disease or one particular organism can be killed by many antibiotics right so you need to know which antibiotic is the best antibiotic or rather which antibiotic is going to kill my bacteria so i do a test which is called as the sensitivity testing so what did i do i took a petri plate i started growing i gave the bacteria all the nutrients in my nutrient agar medium and i started growing my bacteria and i took different antibiotics and i placed it on my plate wherever i can see clear zones that means that but in that particular area microorganism or my bacteria is not growing that means that particular bacteria is killed right these kind of bacteria which cannot grow in presence of an antibiotic are called as sensitive or they are not resistant okay those bacteria which cannot grow in the presence of an antibiotic are called as sensitive or they are also called as non resistant so wherever you can see this clear patch these bacteria are sensitive that clear patch is called as the zone of inhibition i repeat 
the clear patch around the antibiotic is called as the zone of inhibition in one case you can see that around the antibiotic there is no zone of inhibition that means bacteria is still growing near the antibiotic that means that antibiotic is having no effect on the bacteria it is not destroying the bacteria such kind of organisms or such kind of bacteria are called as resistant they are resisting the antibiotic and they are growing in the presence of an antibiotic so it is called as a resistant bacteria i am repeating the experiment again this is called as a sensitivity testing i take my petri plate i put the nutrients in the medium and i put my bacteria to grow for example the bacteria is e coli or salmonella or lactobacillus whatever the organism i am putting it to grow but before allowing it to grow i am placing some antibiotics these antibiotics can be in any form if you've got antibiotic tablet you just place it or if the antibiotic is in liquid form you take a paper disc dip it and you place it on the plate and you allow the organism to grow you keep it in the incubator and you're giving it two days time to grow when you remove the plate you see that there are clear patches around the antibiotic those clear patches are called as the zone of inhibition the organism which cannot grow in the presence of an antibiotic are called as sensitive or non resistant and the organism that is growing in the presence of antibiotic shows that it has no effect of the antibiotic on it are called as the non resistant organism i hope it's easy because you've studied this last year as well so i don't think you should have any confusion after this now for example one particular organism has got three different antibiotics now three different antibiotics can kill one organism so the doctor did a particular test for you and he found out that your organism is salmonella for example now he also knows that there are three antibiotics which can kill salmonella so how does he decide which is the best antibiotic so he is going to again decided by doing antibiotic sensitivity testing so the antibiotic which will give the biggest zone of inhibition is the best antibiotic so can you see from the picture which antibiotic is giving you the biggest zone i guess the third one right so that third antibiotic is the best antibiotic so the doctor is going to prescribe you this particular antibiotic right because it is giving you the biggest zone of inhibition so this was all about antibiotics now we move on to the next sub topic and the last sub topic of our unit that is vaccination what is vaccination when you give a particular vaccine to somebody it is vaccination right so what is vaccine vaccine is a biological preparation which gives you immunity against a disease right a vaccine is a biological preparation that is going to provide immunity against a particular disease a vaccine typically contains an agent that resembles the disease causing microbe that means for example i have i want to make a vaccine for polio so the thing that is that i have as a vaccine is nothing but weakened virus or killed one so a vaccine basically contains dead or weakened pathogens right but they don't make a person ill when you take a vaccine do you fall ill no it is containing dead or weakened pathogen they don't make a person ill but they evoke an immune response how does it happen now 
normally when any foreign invader enters your body foreign invader means anybody the bacteria or virus which is not present in your body who's an outsider who's a foreigner so when a foreign invader enters the body your immune cells are going to respond and they have to destroy it as you know your blood has got white blood cells which provides you immunity so they are going to make antibodies right but it takes a lot of time for the cells to make this antibody first they need to know the bacteria or the virus understand its structure and then only they can make antibodies so the first time when the body faces a particular invader it takes a lot of time for them to produce antibodies and destroy the invader so this is the time where vaccines help you if you took a vaccine for that particular organism see whenever you take a vaccine it is nothing but dead or weakened antigens right so the body is going to recognize it as foreign and the wbcs are immediately going to make antibodies and kill it so second time when the pathogen enters the body already knows okay he had come so i had made this antibody so your body is going to make or your wbcs are going to make those antibodies very quickly and they are going to destroy the pathogen and that is why you don't fall sick that is how vaccines are providing you immunity because vaccine vaccines are acting as fake they are fake right they are dead so vaccines are acting like uh, invaders or bacteria or virus your body is going to destroy them and when the actual virus enters it is going to know that okay when he had come i had made this antibody so immediately those antibodies are made and the pathogen is destroyed this is how you don't fall sick right so in today's class we saw difference between pathogen and parasite the diseases caused by them and what are antibiotics and vaccination so with this alhamdulillah we are done with the first unit and we shall start with the second one in the next class i hope everything is clear if you've got any doubts you can ping me anytime So that's all for the day. Thank you.